everyone, I'm Melissa and welcome to the very first live chat at the newly redesigned greenopolis.com. We are so excited to have you here today as we are truly, truly honored to begin our live chat series with one of today's visionaries, William McDonough. Mr. McDonough is a leader in sustainable approaches to design and architecture and he is helping us change the way we think about efficiency. He's here to discuss today with us his cradle to cradle philosophy, and I am so excited to introduce you to him. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for being here. Well, it's great to be here. Um, you know, I'm here to talk about cradle to cradle and why it's important, and I think the first thing to recognize is that it's in distinction with cradle to grave. So the idea is instead of designing things where we take them from the earth and then we make them into something and then we throw them away, we realize that the whole concept of a way has gone away because where is a way? And, um, and we're looking at cradle to cradle so that things are designed to go back into continuous cycles uh, safely, safely, healthfully, and so on. So I'm a designer and for me design is the first signal of human intention. So the question becomes what is our intention as a species? Because at this point in our history as a species, we realize we are the dominant species and we dominate the entire planet. 99% of the large mammals on the earth are under human management. Uh, we find that the Pacific Ocean in the north is now filling up with plastic, uh, the atmosphere with carbon, uh, the rivers with pollutants and so on and so forth. And so we dominate the world. So if our intention is to pollute it, we are doing a great job. But if that's not our intention, what is our plan? And so, as a designer, I'm worrying about that plan. What should it look like? How would we manifest it? How do we execute it? And um, the idea is to look for long-term visions around which we can take short-term decisions that mean something. And it's important to think this way because it's uh, in interesting to remember that Thomas Jefferson, um, who wrote a letter to James Madison in 1789, uh, was aware of the idea of what he would have characterized as intergenerational remote tyranny, the idea that one generation could tyrannize another. And clearly with the Declaration of Independence, he realized that a remote tyranny by someone somewhere else who cared little and, uh, uh, and was, was causing damage without uh, being involved from a distance, like George III in the case of the United States, was a cause for revolution. So in our case, I think looking at the idea that one generation uh, might tyrannize another generation is cause for revolution, except this time a new industrial revolution. Because we can go back 200 years and realize that there are a lot of things that we've done that aren't great and that why should we perpetuate them when we could start over and create massive innovation uh, for the health and well-being of 9 billion of us who will be here by the mid-century. If we look out at 9 billion people on the planet and think, oh my goodness, it's a population problem. Then we look at a child being born and, and say that the child's part of a population problem, then human rights will cease to exist. So it's critical for us to come up with a design that works for nine billion people. And the good news is that there's a way of celebrating abundance in the world instead of just bemoaning our limits. And not just trying to be more efficient with what we're doing today, which is the old system, but try and be more effective with what we could do for tomorrow and come up with ways that are profitable, healthy, safe, and create an abundance of prosperity for everyone that we can share. So that's really the strategy. So this means the first design question that we have to ask is how do we love all the children of all species for all time? That's the first question. And then the goal has to be really clear. It's a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. If it doesn't fit in that goal, we shouldn't be doing it, clearly. So this brings up the design question of how do we design things. And so I work with a German chemist named Dr. Michael Braungart, who has inspired me with his science and his vision. And we have uh, developed what we call cradle to cradle as a protocol for new design. And the way to think about it is that we're following nature's laws while we do uh, human industrial production. So essentially we design things to either go back to soil safely, we call them biological nutrients, 
or back to industry forever, which we call technical nutrients. So the basic idea is to design things that are safe and healthy and will perpetuate a safe planet or our materials going back and forth so that we can use them over and over again without destroying the biological systems. Now one way to look at this is if we go back to the science of the last century, we can see in Einstein's special theory of relativity, E equals mc squared, that if C is a big number, which it is, then we square it, it's almost infinite, which means that if you multiply it by even a small number of m, it's almost an infinite amount of energy. This is why the nuclear uh, energy system works, because you have a small amount of m and a very big amount of E. But if we think about it from a design perspective for our planet, the energy really wants to come from the sun, because that's our big fusion reactor. And it's in a great place. It's 93 million miles away. It's eight minutes, and it's wireless. So what's our problem? Why wouldn't we want to capture that? So we can work with solar energy as our energy system. So if you think about the sun up here and the earth here, we realize that we have thousands of times more income coming to the earth than we need to operate human systems. And so we can work with that income. And so that's energy. And then when we think about mass, which is chemistry, we realize we don't have a, a mass income. We have an occasional meteorite. So if we take you know, the mass from South Africa, like the chromium, and put it in little products and then distribute it in little holes around the world or burn it or something like that, future generations will look back and say, what were you thinking about when you took all that beautiful mass that we could have used for our industrial products and you've destroyed it, its, its availability and you've made the world toxic in the process? What kind of future generation of thinking will happen in, in that situation. And if you put the energy of the, of the sun together with the mass of the earth, the inorganic chemistry in the water, what do we get? We get biology. And isn't it wonderful that the earth is meant to be growing? And so the idea is to think about growth and to look at growth as the basic concept for the planet, that we're meant to be growing biota. And and if we think about that, then we realize that we can design into that system so we can celebrate growth. More growth is good, uh, and that's because it's healthy and safe, and it, it accrues to the benefit of the planet. So when we look at biological and technical nutrients, we realize that we can celebrate the growth of human productivity and the growth of, of, uh, of our prosperity and the growth of abundance of good things rather than the limits of the bad things that we do. So uh, we see th the world as these biological nutrients, and those are things like cloth or um, food or uh, wood, things like that that can go back to soil to rebuild it. We call them biological nutrients. Other things like computers or cameras or cars we call technical nutrients. And they, they can be designed to go back into those industrial systems. And what's exciting about this is that if we have things that can go back to soil safely, we can rebuild our soils and continue to make food that's safe and healthy. Things like paper should be designed to be totally safe. Why should paper have toxic inks and things like that on it that you could rub off on your fingers or could get into our water or into our smoke and cause cancer and things like that? It's silly at this point in our design history. Uh, other things like computers, if they use lead for soldering of electrical connections or precious metals like copper and things like that, that uh, silver that may end up being toxic, if they're contained within the technical system and we bring the computers back to the computer companies and say, thank you so much for the use of your computer, I'd like a new one, please, and the old computer goes back to becoming new computers and is not released into the biosphere, then it's no longer 